Welcome back to Morrison Heights. Good to see you here tonight. Let's continue our Gospels workshop tonight. Dr. Park and Dr. Greg are going to teach our lesson. If you missed the handout, it's at the front. You can pick one up right now. Tonight is a great night, not only because we have the Gospels workshop, but we also have another workshop at 6 p.m. that launches tonight, and Bill Jones is the leader of it. Bill Jones is teaching Red Sea Rules at 6 p.m. Do you know your room number? You're upstairs. 212. So after this workshop, if you want to start Bill Jones' Red Sea Rules workshop, C212 is the room number, right upstairs at 6. Well, if you check your name off, we appreciate it. You can do that uh, whenever you arrive or, as, or on your way out. Help us keep attendance. And if you're joining us online, we appreciate it if you click, I completed this course online. Uh, please do write your name on one of the papers and your email address so we can add you to the roster for this course. We'll continue this course for the rest of the spring. Uh, we will take one week off in March at spring break, and uh, on Easter we will not meet that evening. Uh, but we're going to continue on to the end of April. Glad that you've joined us for this course. We don't have a video tonight, but we will take questions. I like when you text your questions to me, and we put them to our teachers at the end. So text those to my numbers there on the, uh, on the screen. I'll try to get those to the teachers at the end of the night so we can hear some answers to those. So, uh, well, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then Dr. Park is going to come and get us started. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Christ, we are grateful, and we're honored to be in your presence, and we're uh, ready to be fed by your word. You sustain us in every way, and we ask you to sustain our hearts and our spirits tonight by feeding us with your word. We ask for your spirit to guide our teachers, ask for you to guide us as we study for ourselves, give us insight, and give us faith as we, as we read and understand your word together. Thank you, Lord, for this church and for the many people that are seeking to serve you and glorify you uh, together here. I pray that you will continue to pour out your blessing and let your face shine on us. And I pray that for each person here. In Christ's name, amen. That's an accomplishment to get Bill Jones situated in Clinton and not moving around the country. That's right. That was all me. That was not Greg putting me up to that. That was me. Just glad you're here, Bill. You're stuck here now for how many weeks? Right. Yet to be determined. Okay. Good evening, everyone. The Transfiguration. The Transfiguration, an event that only the Synoptic Gospels record, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That noun, Transfiguration, comes from the Greek verb that our English Bibles translate transfigured. That verb in the Greek language that our English Bibles translates transfigured appears in Matthew chapter 17 verse 2 and Mark chapter 9 verse 2. That Greek verb appears only two other times in the entire New Testament. I read from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 18, but we all, Paul writes, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, listen to this, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The other place besides Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, and Mark chapter 9, verse 2, is... Romans chapter 12, verse 2. You know this. Do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I say to my students, you have no idea how much Greek you actually know. 
the Greek verb is metamorpho, from which we get metamorphosis. And as I said, appearing in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, and Mark chapter 9, verse 2, translated as transfigured, not transformed, transfigured. We know that Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, somewhere in Galilee, go up a mountain, a high mountain. Which mountain is it? I wish we knew for sure. We don't. Some of the candidates include the mountain that you're seeing in this picture that I took, Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor, it's a beautiful mountain. But Jesus didn't carve his initials somewhere to say that he had been there. So we have no idea. Just know it's Galilee and we know it's a high mountain, but why not give you a picture of a possible setting for this event? What matters more is that the event takes place and the synoptic Gospels emphasize, as you can see, the supernatural aspects. What happened? What the disciples did not anticipate. Jesus' face shone like the sun. His clothes even transformed, becoming white as light. Even if Clorox or OxyClean existed back then, such laundry helps could not have attained the hue of white that characterized Jesus' clothing. And Luke tells us, literally, that his clothes were flashing like lightning. And if that wasn't enough, two celebrities from the Old Testament appear, Moses and Elijah. We could interpret Moses as the representative of the law, the first part of the Old Testament canon, and we could interpret Elijah as representative of the prophets, the second part of the Old Testament canon. We know from the synoptics that Elijah and Moses are conversing with Jesus. Only Luke tells us what they talk about, specifically his departure to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Jesus has not yet made that turn that Luke chapter 9, verse 51 records, informing us that he's leaving Galilee for good and making the journey south and west to Jerusalem, and you know what happens there. If that wasn't enough, a cloud formed. If that wasn't enough, the Father speaks. And that leads us, therefore, to the significance of this event. Why and why at this time in the life and ministry of Jesus? For sure, hearing his Father declare to not only him but to Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him, was needed encouragement considering what Jesus knew awaited him in Jerusalem. Who doesn't need encouragement? Jesus needed encouragement. We need encouragement. I love being surrounded by whom I call Barnabases. And I have certain Barnabases who will text me on certain occasions, have no idea when. I have Maureen Clark in, in, in Macomb, Mississippi, and, and she says, I'm your Barnabas, and she'll send me just an encouraging text. And I'm telling you, that just makes me feel like I can climb a mountain or run faster than a look. No, I, I can't do all of that. But it's unbelievable, the power of encouragement. And if that's who you are, God bless you. And if that's whom you strive to be, please do. 
we've got enough critics in the world. We need more encouragers. So, Jesus needed encouragement, and the Father encourages him. For Peter, James, and John, they see what Jesus had always been. I read a verse from the high priestly prayer of Jesus that appears in John's Gospel, chapter 17, and verse 5. I read from the New American Standard, and the New American Standard chooses to use King James language whenever there's a prayer. So bear with me. John chapter 17, verse 5. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory, listen to this, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. They get a glimpse of what he had always been. That which for the sake of his mission, he conceals. In other words, he could have glowed in the dark 24-7. You might wonder, why didn't he? That's the father's prerogative. Probably would have required less faith, right? Less discernment. Believe that guy, the dude that glows in the dark. How hard is that to recognize he's different than everybody else? But his humanity, and he was 100% human, became a stumbling block to many who saw him just as a human being and nothing more. But you and I know better. He had always been God, he still was God, and he remains God for eternity. So the veil was lifted, and Peter, James, and John saw him for who he is. And we will too. That's something to look forward to. Should have had an impact on Peter, James, and John, right? Such that, at least for them, when Jesus appears resurrected in his glorified body, that they would have recognized him. But somehow they don't recognize him. Even though they got a glimpse of what he looked like, they didn't recognize him on, on, on the, the day that, that he had resurrected and then appeared to them. And what's sad to say, and it again reflects not what happened on that mountain, but how we can, can be in the presence of the divine and squander it. We tend to think, just, just, just open up the heavens, God. Uh, just do something magisterial, and, and I will fully appreciate it and fully appropriate it. Yeah, right. Think about, think about the Israelites who saw everything that we would long to see, and what were they doing? Grumbling, exhibiting lack of faith, disobeying, right? We, we want miracles so much, and, and, and we, we overestimate their impact, and when they happen, we undervalue their impact. We just do. Because we, we forget about it. And something else happens. Life takes another turn, and then there we are, grumbling or panicking or whatever. And God has already demonstrated over and over and over again his, his glorious character to us. So they come down from the mountain, and here's what we're told according to Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 9, this is where I conclude. As they were coming down from the mountain, verse 9 from Mark 9, Jesus gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should rise from the dead. And they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> now, of course, I'm not expecting them to explain Jerry Reagan biologically from a cellular level how the body resurrects, I'm not expecting them to provide the anatomy and physiology answer. At least they could have been open to this prospect, right? Fellas, you just saw Jesus' face shine like the sun, his clothes glow in the dark, Moses and Elijah appear, a cloud forms, the Father speaks, and could you at least be more 
accepting that if Jesus says that he's going to rise from the dead, he can do that too. Instead, they're stumbling, bumbling down the mountain. What does it, what does it mean? Rise right, right from the dead? What, what, what does that mean? I'm like, I just want to slap them. But again, we so overestimate the miraculous and we undervalue it when it happens. Thank you, Evan. I invite you to join me in the account found in Matthew of the Transfiguration, chapter 17, Matthew 17. We shall read together. Ivan has told you, obviously correctly, that uh, the Transfiguration occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's called the synoptic gospels. That's a strange word to people who don't study the Bible. Essentially means the same. The stories of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are essentially the same. They have the essential rhythm to them and so forth. There's differences, of course, but they, there's a lot of sameness in the three gospels. And then there's John. And John's gospel is not at all like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not at all. Um, so it's not unusual for something to be found in the three synoptic gospels and not in John. And that is the case here with the transfiguration. But it is referenced in one other book of the New Testament, and we shall read that momentarily. But first let's read the transfiguration account in Matthew 17. Verse 1, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And, they were coming, and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come. He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the baptizer. So this is the story of the transfiguration found in Matthew. There are some minor differences in Mark, minor differences yet in Luke. I would commend the parallel passages to you. I'd like to uh, ask the question, what's the significance of the transfiguration? Why does this happen and what does it mean? And consider that question as we reflect on a couple of things. I want to answer the question first, why does this happen? Why does this happen? The the short answer is to reveal Jesus as the Son of God. To nail down yet again in another way, to say the same thing 
yet again. We might say, well, I thought that was the purposes of the miracles, to validate Jesus as the Son of God. That would be correct. But I would ask you, did the miracles convince everyone? No. If someone were to do a miracle here today, would you automatically say, Messiah? Probably not. You'd probably think it's a trick, or you would think you did that by Satan, or some other explanation that you have at the ready. So miracles alone don't validate Jesus as the Messiah. We know that because God does other things, such as his baptism. At his baptism, he is, there is a dove that descends and, and rests on his shoulder. How many of y'all ever had a dove rest on your shoulder when you were baptized? Okay, I'll go one better. How many of you have ever been with anybody or seen anybody baptized and had a dove come and ran on their shoulder? And then, of course, a voice from heaven. Same thing that's spoken here. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Any of you ever heard a voice from heaven when you were baptized? Or heard somebody else have a voice from heaven when they were baptized? No, you haven't. So you have another validation of Jesus being the Son of God. And yet, even that, not enough. Now we have the transfiguration. I would ask, is the transfiguration enough? Well, as Ivan has already mentioned, nope. Nope, these guys are thick. I mean thick. They don't put the pieces together. They don't see all this. They don't understand all this. They don't know how to take that and compare it to that and that and that and somehow say, this is all the truth until, of course, the resurrection. What if a man comes back from the dead? That's pretty strong. Yes, it sure is. It turns out that the transfiguration is a foreshadowing of that in some way because that's exactly what they're talking about. They come down the mountain and they're talking about the resurrection. That's kind of an interesting connection, right? I mean, you're thinking about uh, Moses and Elijah. You're thinking about Jesus being transformed. You're thinking about bright lights and voices from heaven and somehow you say I know what this is about this is about the resurrection I don't know I'm thinking that maybe those two things don't fit hand in glove it's not my first reaction to say this is all about the resurrection and yet verse 9 says they're coming down the man mountain Jesus tell no one until the son of man is raised from the dead somehow Jesus makes a bold line connection between the transfiguration and resurrection from the dead Well, the most obvious thinking is that you have to ask yourself, who are these other two guys? Well, they're dead. They're dead guys who are now alive guys. Elijah and Moses, these guys are dead. I mean, they've been dead for centuries. And here they are, alive, very much alive. And they're talking to Jesus they know Jesus. Hello. So something's going on here that points to the resurrection. What does it mean when Elijah and Moses are not dead? They're dead. We know they're dead. And yet they're not dead. They're standing here on a mountain with Jesus right in front of Peter, James, and John. So there's a lot going on. So I would simply remind you that what's happening here is that God is validating his son yet again. It is important for us to realize that we don't have a simple data set of proof. We have a very complex data set of proof. In the event that you believe that someone could somehow conjure up these miracles that Jesus did. You believe all that's a charlatan story or he's got smoke and mirrors somewhere at his disposal. In the event that you think that, well, 
None of that explains the transfiguration. What does it mean that Jesus is transfigured? Well, as I have said, the word means to be transformed, to be changed, to use a word we all use all the time. To be changed. And what is he changed into? Well, he's changed into this bright light. Interesting, the Apostle Paul is not here, but he has a reference to the light and Jesus in 1 Timothy 6. Why don't you turn there with me quickly? 1 Timothy 6. Verse 13, where he says to Timothy, again, he's equipping Timothy to be a pastor, to think about eternal things well, so he might teach and preach those eternal things. He says in verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the, the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Now, if you're one of those skeptics, you would say, well, you know, this transfiguration story, Matthew 17, he's full of light. Now you're telling me he dwells in unapproachable light and that no one's ever seen him. Yeah, well, there's heavenly light and then there's earthly light. There is light that you can see with your ocular assets and there is light that you cannot see that you've never seen. And the scripture says that the glory of Christ is best described with this term, unapproachable light. Is it possible that there is a noise so loud, so piercing, so damaging that you cannot endure it? Of course there is. Is it possible that there's a light that's so bright, that's so brilliant, that you cannot endure it? Of course there is. And the Bible says that this is the nature of what it means to be God. That he is not like me. And all I get to see of him is what he permits me to see of him. What he's equipped me to see of him. So what's going on in Matthew 17? Peter, James, and John are brought along. Why? Because God wants them to see something. Jesus is transfigured. He's transformed in front of them. He's changed. And his clothes are so white that nothing in their understanding of laundry detergent could ever make anything that white. Why? Why? Because they, God wants them to be the eyewitnesses that tell this story later. Peter does so in 2 Peter chapter 1. Turn there, if you will. Regarding his credentials as a pastor, preacher, Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.16, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, so there's Peter's explanation for why this happened, in order that Jesus might be given honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. By the way, that's an interesting name for God right there, one of the great references Oh, this is the only place in Scripture where that word is used. Majestic. He is the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. 
So Peter is alluding to the transfiguration here, of course, and saying, we didn't come to you with cleverly devised myths. It's not a bunch of stories, not a bunch of spaghetti or gumbo that we put together and throw it on the wall. It's not what's going on here. In fact, we're telling you exactly what's happened in our lives. We're telling you exactly what we've seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears. We're telling you the truth. And the truth is, Jesus is God. And God has declared him so by means of the transfiguration. But what does it all mean? Well, that's where you can get in some really deep water. Hmm. I'm going to try not to lose you, but two or three, you're going to, your eyes are going to glaze over on me. You're going to nod off on me. So sit up straight, breathe deeply, and hang in there with me. The similarities between Matthew 17 and the Exodus are remarkable. You might say, well, who needs to know about the Exodus? Hmm. Well, it turns out that the Exodus is the most referenced experience in the Old Testament in the rest of the Bible. In other words, the New Testament references the Exodus more in, than anything else. So what's going on in the Exodus? Well, on one level, we just simply say God wants to deliver his people and he rescues them from slavery, to which we would say, amen, that's right. That's what he's doing. But as it turns out, there's a lot more going on in the Exodus. God is announcing punishment against the gods of the age. It's a defeat. It's the, it's the chapter in the war. It's the epic battle, if you will. I would tell you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more spectacular battle reference in the Bible. I mean, you got a bigger story than an army wades off into the Red Sea on dry land only to be pounced upon by the water and drowned every last single member of Pharaoh's army. You got a battle story bigger than that one? I don't think so. So it turns out the Exodus is the high water mark for the conflict, if you will, between God and the spirit of the age, God and the enemy of God. Beyond that, you have this uh, result from that. You have the people of God that come right out of the Exodus and they make their way immediately to Mount Sinai and they enter into covenant with God. Let's, call it, let's give the covenant a name. Let's call it the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it turns out that the Old Covenant is a really big deal. Now, who's the spokesman for God in the Old Covenant? Yeah, that'd be this guy, Moses. So there's a lot going on here. There's a, and where does all this Old Covenant stuff happen? It turns out it happens on a mountain. By the way, Ivan has told you that we don't know for sure where the Mount of Transfiguration is. There's two major theories. If you go to Israel, whoever your tour guide is will give you his theory, and that's pretty much what you're stuck with. But there are two major theories. In fact, we don't even know where Mount Sinai is. Two major theories on where Mount Sinai is. It's not like the folks who were doing maps back then labeled them very well. So there's a mountain. Then what happens on this mountain? Moses goes up on the mountain in the book of Exodus, and he comes down, and what's going on with Moses? His face shone brightly. Why is that? He'd been with God. What's going on in the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration? 
Jesus shines so brightly they can't even look at him. Why? Not because he's been with God, but because he was God. He's revealed as such. There's a difference. You'll note that God speaks here, and he speaks from a cloud. A cloud. Now, where have we heard of a speaking cloud in the Bible? That's right, Mount Sinai. God speaks from the cloud. Well, we could go on. I will tell you there are a number of similarities between the Mount of Transfiguration and the Mount Sinai experience of Moses. What does it all mean? Well, it means, it, well, let, me, let me start at the beginning. What does Exodus mean? What does the Exodus really mean? What's going on? God is delivering his people from slavery. God is leading them into the promised land. God is entering into covenant with his people. The Exodus means all of these things and so many more things. But those are essentially the high water marks. Freedom from slavery, deliverance into the promised land, and enter into a relationship with a God who promises never to kill you, but provide for you if you will be faithful. So there's this covenant that grows out of the Exodus. So does Israel have a covenant prior to that? No, they don't. What's going on in the Mount of Transfiguration? God is doing the same thing. He is setting his people free. Why are they talking about the resurrection of the dead? Because the point of the Transfiguration is to point to the future glory of Christ to inaugurate not a covenant made on tablets, but a, tub, ta a covenant that's written on the hearts of men that's going to be accomplished by the death, burial, and resurrection of this very one. The, the covenant in the Old Testament is foreshadowing the covenant that's coming that's going to be the, the true covenant, the better covenant, the life-giving, eternal life-giving covenant. And all of that is happening here on the Mount of Transfiguration. Just as Sinai precedes the Old Covenant, here the Mount of Transfiguration precedes the New Covenant. What's going on in Matthew 17? It's the Transfiguration. Jesus, at the end of this chapter, foretells his death. And then immediately, he sets his face to Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem to finish the making of the covenant, to accomplish the reconciliation between God and man, to bring us out of slavery. So the Mount of Transfiguration serves as a final exclamation point, if you will, for God to inaugurate or to announce the inauguration of a new covenant. It is a call for us to believe and to trust and to worship. And even as the folks have gone before us worshiped and look forward to that day we too worship and rejoice in that day that God sent his only begotten son to give himself for us and to be our sacrifice and to accomplish our freedom from slavery we are not without hope we instead cling to the one who dwells in unapproachable light, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory to God. Believe in Jesus. He is God. Amen. Thank you. Brother Tim. Brother I. All right. Thank you. We do have some questions. The first one, I don't know if we can know this. How many times does the word for trans, transfiguration appear in the Old Testament? Uh, if one uh, of us knows, it's you. Well, I don't want to sound sarcastic, but the, the, the verb in the New Testament is Greek. So the Old Testament languages are Hebrew and Aramaic. So this 
verb as it appears literally does not appear in the Old Testament scripture. I cannot tell you off the top of my head how often that the verb appears in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is known as the Septuagint. So I'm not being facetious, and at the same time, I'm conceding ignorance. I do not know how often the Greek translators looked at the Old Testament and found a verb that means change and then substituted metamorpho for that. So I don't know. I tried to run a search on the Septuagint, but apparently I can't do it on my iPad, so I don't know the answer to that either. I'm no better than the iPad. <laughs> uh, why is Elijah important to Jesus? There are a couple of questions regarding why Moses and Elijah, but Elijah specifically got some attention. Well, I'm in reference to that. Um, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the pop prophets. That's two of the three most significant portions of the Old Testament. And uh, could also be pointed out that, uh, you know, Elijah does not die. He is translated, transported. Uh, and there's, uh, some, there's some biblical scholars, I could speak to this better than me, but who actually believe that Moses did not die. That God buried him, that's what the Bible says, so I'm going with that, by the way. <laughs> but there are others who reject that and say, well, Moses didn't actually die. There's a tradition of some stream of thought that he didn't die. So the theory is that the reason these two fellows show up is because neither one of them actually experienced physical death. I think that's a complete reach. I'm not buying that. Uh, I think the easiest answer is to simply say they represent the pinnacle of each of their respective uh, areas, if you will, of serving God. So who is the ultimate prophet? Moses. Who is the ultimate, I mean, uh, Elijah. Who is the ultimate lawgiver? Moses. That's probably the best answer I've got. I, I would probably have something better. I, I would agree with everything he said, and I certainly do believe that Moses did experience death, buried, but we just don't know where his body is, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Of course, there is this expectation, rightfully so, among folks who understand the scripture, that Elijah will come. That's the last chapter of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4. We know, thanks to Dr. Gregg's reference to Matthew chapter 17, that Jesus says, Elijah has come, and they did to him what they would have done, and that's John the Baptist. Of course, the Jews to this day reject the entire New Testament, so if you ever go to a Passover Seder, they set a place for Elijah, and at, at some point in the meal, a child is instructed to go to the door and to see if Elijah is outside. Because again, they wouldn't accept Jesus, they don't accept John the Baptist. I say, I'm gonna trust Jesus that Elijah has come and that was John the Baptist. One last thought is that, go back to the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 17 says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, no, I came to fulfill them. And here you have on the mountain, I know this is, this is I guess a little symbolic, a little figurative here, is that they're not arguing with Jesus. No, um, they are talking to him, conversing. They are in total agreement with Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Everything that he does is fulfill the law and the prophets. And who is the face of the law? Moses. Who is the face of the prophets? Elijah. Yep. Was the mountain of transfiguration in the promised land, and does that count as Moses entering the promised land, since God <laughs> told him? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. He eventually got to the better promised land. He wasn't worried about the dirt in right. Israel. Right. There is a land that's fairer than day. Thank you. Move along. I have an answer to that question better than me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good thought. How did the apostles know it was Moses and Elijah? They didn't have photographs of them. Well, <laughs> uh, we're not reading a transcript here of everything that was said, correct? 
So I'm sure there had to have been some more <laughs> dialogue um, than, than just what we have recorded. But you're right, they don't have pictures and there's no name tag, I'm, I'm Moses and I'm Elijah, but uh, I, I, you know, Jesus knows them for sure, they know Jesus. And you gotta, this is where the chosen would probably fill in the gaps here and, 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 uh, and, and dramatize it in a good way, you know? If so. they put name tags, I was going to credit you. No. <laughs> no. Uh, How did they know? How did they know? Right. Why were only some of the disciples able to witness this? Mm. Well, we see this consistently. That uh, and, and go back to last last fall when we when when uh, we covered the call of the disciples and. There's a PowerPoint where I listed the, the 12 names, and they really break down into three groups of four. And, and, and the, the first position is always Peter, no matter what the list, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or the book of Acts. And, and then below Peter is uh, Andrew, James, and John. And then you'll note there's, there's a number of instances where if it's, if it's just three, it's Peter, James, and John, who, who, who witness it. I, I can't tell you why. I can infer, but I just know that if there's something that's only experienced by a select sample of the disciples, it will be Peter, James, and John. Think about the, the little girl who's 12 years old. She has died. Jesus goes into that home. Well, who goes inside the house? It's not only Jesus, but it's Peter, James, and John. So, could it be, because we, we know more about them than the other disciples, that they, they seem to be the, the movers and shakers within, that they're, they're the top uh, three or four names, and, and so uh, they're the ones uh, that, that are, I guess, the representatives of the whole. It's not that Jesus discounts the other nine, it's just that they seem to. Uh, and Dr. Greg went through the whole 12-week series on the disciples, and I'm sure he's probably uh, thought about this. And I, I couldn't add to that any more than you did, brother. That's, I, that's exactly right. Why yeah. does Jesus select three to be more intimate with him? Jesus alone knows. The rest yeah. of us are guessing. Right. I'm just imagining my wife watching a coin flip at a football game and saying, why do those guys get to go out there to the middle? <laughs> And, and then, you know, in, in Matthew's account, what are the other nine doing at the base of the mountain? They're, they're, they're fumbling uh, an opportunity to cast out a, a, a demon, and, uh, and Jesus has to rebuke them and to say, you didn't even think about praying? <laughs> and so, uh, not to say that the, the top three were better than the bottom nine, but uh, the ones that below the mountain aren't doing much better. Yeah. This is more of a comment, but I'll phrase it as a question. Uh, why doesn't, why weren't they terrified until the father spoke from the cloud? They're looking at the garments white as lightning, Moses and Elijah show up, but it's not until God speaks that they're terrified. Anything to that? Well, if you'll study the speaking of God mm -hmm. references in the Bible, it always produces terror, mm -hmm. always. Yeah. And so... It, it, it's almost, I don't know, I haven't done a complete study of this, but I, I would think it, I don't, I don't know of a single place in the Bible where it says that God speaks, with the possible exception of Jesus' baptism, where there's not fear. Right. So apparently, apparently there's something about the way God speaks that produces fear. Right. I say that without being cheesy, but there's something going on there. I'm guessing right here, right now, if you heard the voice of God speak in this room, your dominant reaction would be fear. And if it's not, then your dominant action is foolishness. Mm -hmm. You're a fool not to be afraid. If you enter the presence of God and you know that's God and you're not afraid, I'm sorry. You, you're not reading the Bible very closely. So nobody survives that unless they're covered. And that we are covered because we're under the blood. But that's, our, that's my only covering. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, that's my answer. I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's not only, I, I would say it's not just the tone or the volume, although that would be, to me, impressive enough. Mm -hmm. But it's, the, it's the, the significance of the one who's speaking to us as well. And that's also conveyed through the tone and, and, and through um, the volume. And, and what, there's one interesting account. Uh, it's in John's Gospel when uh, it's the arrest of Jesus. And they ask who he is. Are you Jesus? And he says, I am. And when he says that, what's fascinating is these armed guards, soldiers, you go to John's Gospel, chapter 8, they fall back. And here's just... Here's Jesus just speaking in his, I guess, normal voice, but, but, but because of when he says, I am, there, there is the power of that revelation. And it, they, it, here are these antagonistic people coming to arrest him. They can't even handle the, the revelation of God, even though they don't even believe who he is. And it's a beautiful picture of he is the I am, and, and, uh, and he, commands the, uh, he commands respect. He does. Here's the next question. Will Elijah precede Jesus' second coming? I, me personally, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know of a, he's already come. Uh, there's, there's, you know, Jesus comes like a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. There's, there's no heralding like, like John the Baptist is preparing the people. Uh, Y'all, we should know he's coming back. That, that, that's something. There doesn't need to be another announcement or preparation. I agree with that, but if he comes back, it doesn't mean that God has done something he didn't say he was going to do. So I'm holding out a 1% chance that he might come back again in some way. But my 99 and 44, 100% conviction is he's already come, and that's all that's necessary. Mm. As we worked, Eric Busby was doing a search in the Septuagint okay. of metamorphomai. Way to go, Eric. Thank you. And he said zero occurrences, okay. according to his well, That Greek search. word does not appear in there. There we go. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this reminds me of something you would write on a paper you're grading. Could you not be more specific? So the question is, why don't we know where the mountains are? Couldn't God have made things better known one way or another? <laughs> yes, he could have. Yes, but he, he didn't. Could. But he didn't. So get over it. That's <laughs> right. right. That's right. Listen, let me tell you a story. <laughs> if you go to Israel, and I hope you do, before you die, you should go. The history of the nation of Israel has been, you know, varied. They've had all kinds of folks who have dominated them and ruled over them and controlled them and so forth. And the people who have controlled them have either uh, added to or destroyed things that we read in the Bible. If, if somebody came in and, and took over Clinton, Mississippi, they would remake Clinton, Mississippi in the image that they wanted. So they could tear down anything they wanted. They could build up anything they wanted. They could eliminate from memory or eradicate books and so forth. Propaganda. Ever heard of that? And you put these things out of people's minds and so forth. We, we think that somehow because this is the holy land that God owes us this special loving care for the last 2,000 years to protect a million of questions that we may have about various things. The answer to that is no, he, he chose not to do that. He chose not to protect even the birthplace of Jesus, if you go to Bethlehem, the, the, well, the second most cheesy place in all of Israel is the birthplace of Jesus. I mean, the, it, the, the Catholic Church has turned that into a tourist mecca over the years. And uh, so I'm, I'm not telling you that uh, these places are not real. I'm just telling you these places are unknown to us. But if, if I need to make some money, and I told you that this, this relic of a speaker stand, this pulpit right here, Moses used that on the sea, at, at the edge of the Red Sea, speaking to the people. 
there would be somebody just gullible enough to believe that that's true. You can go all across the ancient world and people, they've got pieces of Abraham's beard. They've got pieces of Noah's beard. They've got pieces of Moses' beard. Do you really think <laughs> that's Moses' beard? Well, I'm telling you, a lot of people do. Because we want these associations to be real. Because it makes it, I don't know, come alive for us. I'm not telling you that we can't know where these things are. But if we don't know, we don't know. And God has decided we don't, we're not owed that knowledge. Yeah. It's okay, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Don't let it rattle your cage or shake your faith that you don't know which of two primary mountains in Israel is the right one. If he told us which one, we would know. I'll give you an illustration. We, did, we were studying Samuel this week in the pastor's conference. And so in 1 Samuel 22 is the witch of Endor passage. And they're in a, at a mountain. They're at the edge of a mountain. So there's a mountain over here, and they name the mountain. There's a mountain over here, and they name the mountain. And the witch lives in Endor in 1 Samuel 22. Okay, guess what? You go to Israel, and there's Endor. And it's the foot of that mountain that God names in 1 Samuel 22. And it's the foot of that mountain that God names in 1 Samuel 22. Why did God want me to know the names of the mountains that stand above the city of Endor where the witch was? I don't know. But he told us the names of those mountains, and they're still there. But God did not tell me the mountain of transfiguration. Why not? I don't know. But if it's a high mountain, there aren't many options. So... There you go. Go to Israel. Look for high mountains. There's a bunch of little mountains. <laughs> but what's the name of the mountain up in uh, northeast Mississippi? Huh? Some of y'all know. What's the highest point in Mississippi? Must be Wolf Mount Woodall. How high is Mount Woodall? I have no idea, but it's a low mountain. I assure you that. <laughs> All right. You go to Israel. There's a bunch of low mountains. But there's one or two or three or four high mountains. Mm -hmm. And that would be the odds-on choice for that's where it would be. Sorry about that rant. But it got all <laughs> over me. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Thank you. One last question. It's a follow-up from last week. We talked about no sacrifice for intentional sin. The question was, is there such a thing as unintentional sin? Sure. Um, ignorance doesn't excuse if I've done something that is wrong. Haven't we all apologized because we were apprised of something that we did that hurt someone else? And we couldn't say, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that, so get over that. You, can't, you cannot, by saying, I, I didn't intend to do that, erase that which happened. So are there things that is it possible that even now with all of the revelation that we have, which is the scripture, to still do things that we knowingly didn't realize? Or, yeah, there is. And, and uh, you, you know, you, you just hang out with me for a while and, and then you'll find out how many times I've had to apologize for things that I, I didn't realize I hurt someone's feelings. I, I didn't realize I did that. Uh, that's, that's on me. That doesn't mean that I, I'm, I'm innocent of it, and there's still, I must apologize for it, I must repent of it, and uh, accept it if I'm confronted. So, um, yeah, it, it is possible. I, that's, a, that's a more personalized devotional answer than, the, than the, um, the actual, but, you know, could it be that back in the day, they, I mean, they, they didn't have their personal scripture, so, you know, that they, they were doing things that they should have known what the law said, but they, but they somehow were ignorant of it because they didn't study it well. But did that mean, oh, I didn't know it, so it's not on me? Uh, it is possible. My life is the proof that it's possible to do something unintentionally and still hurt somebody or do something wrong. Yeah. So. Love when you bring up Marianne. <laughs> I know. I wasn't going to mention Marianne, but you, you rightfully did. Dr. Greg, close us in. Let's pray. Yeah. God, thank you for the gift of the Bible. You're a great God. You're so kind to us to give us that which we need. 
I rejoice, Lord, we have a church that actually wants to study the Bible. Praise, praise, praise God. And I pray, Father, we continue to find Jesus on every page and remember that he's the reason. He's the point. He's the explanation. And he's the goal. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hmm? Mount Wood.